God for a morning that started with uh, chaos and just a, a different pattern. And so often we are uh, creatures of a pattern and we follow uh, what's normal and what's the same and even the disruption of a, of a daily routine sometimes can be uh, more than just a disruption, it, uh, it sort of sets us off kilter, and it takes us a while to recover. So, uh, help us, O oh God, this morning. We, pray. we ask, O oh God, that you would be with us in our time of study, our time of fellowship, our time of being together. And we ask, Lord, that if there are things that need to be opened um, to borrow, the Luke text from last Sunday, if there are areas that uh, we need to learn so that we have different perspective, or if there are experiences that we need to have with you, uh, again, oh God, we open ourselves up to those this morning, and we ask, Lord, that you would use this time uh, for your benefit. We know that if you do it for yours, then ultimately it will be for our benefit as well. Uh, bless those who... Uh, who now sit in the path of a storm and those who are in the wake and the various levels of depravity and sadness and destruction and fear, uh, particularly those families who have lost loved ones, help them, oh God. And if there's any consolation that can come from a group of people who unite in one heart and in one thought and hopes for comfort to come. We pray for that, O oh God. Uh, this we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. When that exuberance. <laughs> Pardon me? Was that exuberance? Uh, maybe. Who knows? All right. Perfect. Okay. Um, you know, just kind of keep in mind where we're at in the book. This is the, this is the last part of the first big topic that Paul is addressing, uh, which is um, the, the idea of this disruption around uh, factions and uh, theological cliques and leaders. And uh, I'm sure there's a level of politics involved, even though uh, Paul doesn't mention that. Um, you know, there's just people are self-promoting themselves or self-promoting their their, their theological ways or concepts, their self-promoting uh, their leadership at the expense of the entire whole. And, uh, and, and although that can be helpful in some situations, in this particular situation, it's destructive for the church. Uh, and so what was designed, uh, people who have been given the opportunity and blessed with the privilege of leadership and the responsibility that comes with that, uh, what's required is to build up the people, not to take away or not to, to destroy. And so Paul has uh, addressed this over the last, uh, uh, about the middle of the first chapter on into chapter 4. First he talks about it in terms of theology, and uh, in the end of chapter 1, beginning of chapter 2, he uh, resets the baseline, now that's my term, but basically re reminds them, calls them back to who they are and why they do what they do. And, uh, you know, a number of weeks ago, we, we talked about uh, the idea that what we're all held accountable to is the mission of the church. So regardless of what position or what role that we play inside of the church, inside of God's kingdom, we, we all are under the mission. And the mission is uh, Christ, uh, Christ crucified, Christ's resurrection, uh, salvation that is offered uh, by God uh, via Christ. And uh, so that's what we're all held accountable to. And uh, so he, he sets that baseline again. Because so often, whenever churches uh, get in trouble or wherever organizations or groups get in trouble, um, I, I don't, I'm sure there might be one, but I don't know of anyone right offhand uh, that uh, isn't the result of a group or a church um, 
usurping the mission for something else. I mean, when, when churches blow up and they split, what's happened is they've become these either uh, personnel issue, uh, building issues, theological issues at the expense of the mission of the church. And, and so it really, it never really goes away. And, uh, and so Paul reminds the congregation, very that's the first thing he talks about after his greeting is, remember who you are, what God has done in your life, and to remember that we, it, you know, what, what's most important is it's about God and Jesus, not about our own, our own thoughts, our own issues, or things along those lines. In chapter 3, he draws upon some uh, analogies to, to further this line of thought uh, not so much on the theological side, but on the, just for the masses, the people that are inside the church, that uh, if there are leaders that we kind of gravitate to, and he, notice now, he never in chapter 3 says that's a bad thing. He doesn't say people who, who fall under Paul's camp or people who fall under Apollos' camp or people who fall under Peter's camp, or, or you know, the, the terms that he uses to describe some of the major groups in the church. He doesn't say that that's wrong. He just says that it get, we get in trouble if that then becomes what's most important. And, and so, um, um, you know, naturally, you're going to gravitate towards certain leaders. You're going to gravitate towards certain uh certain aspects of theology we've talked in, in either in, I know we talked in when we were in Mark when we looked at Mark but we, we also talked a little bit when we, in First Corinthians most people theologically operate they take one major concept or component of God or at least how we explain God or understand God and that becomes their primary lens by which they see everything else um, that, that's a good thing. There, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, however, if, if one smaller concept replaces the whole, then, then that's where we can get in trouble. And, uh, but, but naturally, we do that. It normally comes out of our experiences. Um, uh, you, know, you can't get away from all the experiences that you've had in your life. They formed who you are, and they formed who we are today. Good, bad, or different, and they're all—they all get brought into the bucket that makes us who we are. Out of that, naturally. Now, this is my hypothesis. Now, I didn't say this in the text. I'm just telling you from, from my thoughts on this. Out of that, we naturally gravitate towards one aspect of God, uh, and, and that's the lens by which we see everything else. Uh, for instance, the Reformation. The Reformation. That whole time period, what they were looking for was uh, in a time of the church where there were, uh, when, when there were some, just some abuses that were going on, where do we find authority? And so they, they said, okay, we, we see that inside the Trinitarian Godhead, the role of Jesus for salvation, and that what Jesus does on the cross is so profound that there's an instantaneous aspect of salvation and there's a process aspect of salvation. And, and so what, what starts is this justification by faith, which becomes a hallmark for the Protestant Reformation. Uh, but if you look at some of the things that, you, you know, if you, if you do a, just a study on Martin Luther, not so much his theology first, but if you look at him just as the, the person in history, you look at John Calvin, you look at uh, Swingley, Thomas Munzer, some others, what you'll discover is when you'll start to see that there were things going on in their life that you can make a pretty good assumption that the reason why they're looking for this idea of God as sovereign, it's an easy, it's an easy connection. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. right. um, and so we, we are who we are, and we're, we're, the, you know, we, we're formed by our experiences, and naturally, I think a person gravitates towards a certain aspect of theology that that becomes their, you know, there might be one or two or three issues that they might draw towards and that becomes their, uh, that becomes the major lens that influences how they see humanity, how they see themselves, how they see the church, how they see sin, you know, any other component or, or aspect of theology, they see it through that particular lens. 
and I think it's heavy weighted by our experiences. Uh, that's good, that's natural, nothing wrong with that. The only danger or pitfall would be is if that one particular lens uh, becomes more important than all the lenses that make up who God is. Because no one denomination has the, the market on it all, if that makes sense. I mean, there, there are aspects, you know, in there are some things that the, the uh, Methodist Church, uh, Arminianism, Wesleyanism, uh, you know, they take a certain, they take the lens of God as parent, and they do very well with that. Uh, Calvinist theologies take the, the lens, uh, lens of God as sovereign, they do very well with that. Uh, you know, Catholic side of the church, incarnation, they do very well with that. And so, uh, to, you know, to get the best picture of God is to understand what the pitfalls are from each of those lenses and know what they are, but to see the full picture of it. Are you with me? Because we get in trouble if we say, how I see God, you know, how Shane sees God, it becomes, you know, becomes the entire definition of who God is. Uh, you, know, I, you know, you can put God in a box, you know, as, I mean, which means that God is limited by my perceptions and experience and understanding. Now, I can be very dogmatic with that and then say, okay, if I'm a leader, say, say I'm the, a leader of St. Paul, I think that's probably fair. All right. And so then I, everybody who is who makes up St. Paul, I could say, well, if you don't see this view of God, then something's wrong. That's what's going on in the text. And so what Paul is, what Paul does is he takes takes this whole concept of what the leaders in Corinth was doing, and says, "Hang on, there is an understanding. Let's get back to the basis of it all. God is the one who's doing all this work. God is the one who's who's working inside of Jesus Christ. You have experienced that, Corinth people, but you need to realize it's not." You know, they're, they're, you're operating by what you've experienced and what you know, which is good, but there could be something else at stake here. And in chapter 3, he uses the uh, analogy of a builder that says, you know, from your own experience, leaders in Corinth, uh, you're building on something. You're building up the kingdom to, to, to your ability. But it sits on a foundation that's much larger than whatever work you might do. And that foundation is Jesus. Right? So that's kind of what's going on in the first couple of chapters. And then when we get to chapter 4, he's now dealing with, uh, uh, he's dealing with the leaders more so than... Wow, this is not going to be good. Um, uh oh. Um, so, uh, just in case you didn't get that, we're going to leave that up there for a while. So, uh, but in chapter four, he's dealing with some of the leaders, and and, and basically uh, is going to talk about the qualities. Uh, of what it takes, uh, of what, what a leader should be. Um, we looked at the first few verses last week and we see that um, he uses this word steward in chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, that they've been given something, a steward of God's mystery. Uh, that's very significant and very important. Uh, notice that it's not their own mystery, it's not their own teaching, it's not their own doings. This is something that... Uh, that God has given to them. And so you've got this idea of subservient type person, subservient type quality of those who are leaders. Um, you know, this is one of, this is probably, it's not the beginning of, but I mean, over the last probably 30, 40 years, the whole concept, well, not, not quite that long, maybe, uh, maybe 20 years, the whole concept of servant leadership, you probably read books about that. I know Bill Turner wrote a book on servant leadership. Um, he was the only one to coin that. I mean, it, was out, it was around before him. Uh, but definitely he illustrated that in his life uh, and, and, and how he operated. And there are others inside Columbus who have done very well. I think Columbus State uh, actually even developed a servant leadership, leadership program in, when it comes to business. 
uh, but you get this idea that leadership is uh, is from the bottom up, uh, or at least an intent that way. And and you can see some some bedrock of this inside the text. You can see some foundations of this inside the text, where those who serve in leadership, they they need to see themselves and understand that just because their status gives them a certain level of authority, uh, they are still subservient to uh, what, what is ahead of them. And what is ahead of, ahead of them or over them, according to Paul, is that it's God. They're not, they're not preaching their own gospel. They're, uh, I mean, they're two very, they're different words, the word for servant and the word for steward. But they have the same that um, they have the same connotation. I mean, it, you can't get away from the fact that uh, you know you you know you are under authority, and it's God's authority, and and not our own. And so uh, I think last week we even looked at the idea of what what I think every lay person should expect from clergy persons that serve. Uh, and, and that should not be something that should ever be sacrificed or uh, checked at the door. I mean, that should be something that is up front. Um, and and I'll mean, use the word, uh, I want a word that's stronger than expectation. Maybe we can put like this soft understanding of a, a demanding expectation. This is the requirement. This is the prerequisite. For those who serve, and it's not just for clergy. I mean, in our we live in a professional clergy type uh, environment that they didn't have in, in, in the uh, the time when Paul was writing this. But for anybody to serve, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're, you know, what we would call the head of a certain ministry, or involved with a committee that oversees, has oversight over committees, or if you're involved in a parachurch ministry, it doesn't even have to be here at St. Paul or, or a church that you might attend. Um, you know, if you're if you're in something that bears the name of Christ, and that is, you know, that that is where you're at, and at the same time, that is what you're doing, what you're a part of. There, there, there needs to be a level of what what we expect from our leaders. All of them is this idea that they are first a servant and a steward, which means it is not theirs, and it never will be. And uh, uh, you know, so often, how many times? Well. Uh, do you ever hear people talk about it in terms, and I'm guilty of doing this myself, uh, where you hear clergy or staff members or something in the church, where they'll say, my ministry? You ever hear that? My ministry? It's kind of arrogant, isn't it? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I mean, I know we're, we're using the pronoun there, but you know, on, on one level, it's not my ministry, or it's not their ministry. Uh, I mean, it's, there might be a better way. We use it just because it's easier to, to describe what we're trying to convey. But the thought behind it uh, really should be is that it's not any of our mind or the, the supposed possessive pronoun as much as it should be it's his. We're, we're just, uh, we're, we're along for the ride, for lack of better words. We're participatory people. Uh, he is the major agent. And uh, sometimes we forget that, and, and even in this day, and if you get it, if you forget it to a various level or degree, then you can go down patterns that are similar to corn. Uh, now, don't go out of here thinking, "Gosh, I can't say my ministry or our ministry," <laughs> or you know, come up with some generic. You know, it's the churches that sit under God. It's not even St. Paul or First Baptist or you know whatever. It's okay. I mean, don't don't you know? But we can. You understand what I'm talking about. So. At least I hope you do. If not, we'll uh, at the break we we'll talk a little bit more about it. All right. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at uh, when it comes to what we've looked at uh, in in previous uh, meetings. Um, and uh, so let's let's go on uh, into chapter four. Uh, someone, if they would read, actually, just start again with chapter one and, and read down through uh, chapter uh, chapter seven. I mean, ooh, not chapter 7, that's why. Excuse me. 4, 1 through 4, 7. If somebody would read that, that would be great. So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. 
Now it is required that those who have been given the trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even trust myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, Do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? All right, thank you, Matt. So what you got, Paul, is, um, again, addressing the leaders. One, their servants, their stewards. Uh, they sit under, now I've given you this term, the mission of the church. Um, but uh, he doesn't call it the missions of the church. He just says you sit under God, you sit under Christ. But if it is Christ's, if it is His ministry, then it would, you know, you can see why He makes this assumption. Then it's, it's He's the one that is the judge, gives the gifts, even though we're not. He, he will take that subject up later in verses, I mean, in chapters 12 through 14. But you know what He's getting at this idea that if everything is about Christ. And you know what we do is founded on his ministry, harking back to chapter three. Then it would make sense that as leaders, uh, the one who judges what we do is not ourselves. It's Christ. You know, our comparison is not against how we're how well we're doing against the next person or the next leader or what have you. But uh, if we're going to compare ourselves against somebody and actually give them a, a judgment. Uh, about how, how we're doing, we need to be compared to Christ. Ultimately, He is the, the giver of what we have, uh, and He is the one that holds us accountable. Uh, so again, He's reminding, you know, this is just kind of a restatement of what we've, always, we've, we've already looked at, the idea that at any point in the game, I think in your version it says, uh, trust, not trust like, will you trust me, but trust like trust account, trust department. Uh, you know, like custodian, you know. Um, I remember when um, if, you know when children are born. You know, you open up bank accounts for them, and you know they're in their name, their social. But all of, I mean, for a period of time, you you are their custodian. You are their trust person. You you conduct business on their behalf, but it's not yours. It's theirs. It's somebody else's. And so we we are uh, we are trustees to the gospel. We are custodians of the gospel. Uh, it's not our gospel; it belongs to God. But we we work, we act. But in the end, we're held accountable to uh, to Christ, to His. I mean, it's His. Uh, you know, which is why you don't find, and whenever the scriptures talk about. Um, judgment time in various capacities, different books of the Bible. It, you know, uh, our works might be judged, uh, but what's being judged is how well were we the custodian? How well are we the trust agent? And so we're we're not. Uh, see, we like judgment to be where I can judge myself. Again. It makes us feel better. And most of us, I think it's going to bring up some bad memories, but. Think back to when we looked at C.S. Lewis. Remember that book, you know, that we love so much. But uh, you know, think back to when we were talking about all that. You know, uh, Lewis gives you this wonderful analogy that says, and he uses the idea of a tennis player. He says we like to judge our best game of tennis against our opponent's worst game. I mean, they're famous for this. Let me tell you. You know, you ask a golfer what they shoot in their mind. Of course, they'll probably lowball, but in their mind. What they hold as the standard is their best round of golf, but that's you know it might be they shoot that once or twice a year. You know the average you know seldom do you find golfers. Now, there are some, you know they'll say my you know I'm the type of golfer 
you know, whatever my last round was, that's the type of golfer I was. You know, they're probably more mature and self, you know, they, they can self-identify better than the next. But you know, the average golfer will say they equate their goodness on the golf course to what their best game is, not what their worst game is. And uh, but we, we love doing that where when it comes to judgment, the idea of judging our best against someone else's worst. For instance, whenever you, and I know you don't do that, but let's just say what ifs. What if tomorrow when you get up and you look in the mirror, I want you to ask yourself a comparison question. How good am I? Right? And, uh, you know, some of us will, because we know the answer, we'll naturally say, well, I'm not good because I'm going to compare myself to Jesus. All right, after you've done the Sunday school lesson, dismiss that and actually ask, you know, if you're going to compare yourself to someone else, how many of us will pick Mother Teresa or Billy Graham type person? <laughs> Probably not. But now the neighbor down the road who doesn't cut his grass and he's just a kind of a pain in the fanny, you know, just kind of, you know, we really wish he would move. That's probably who we're going to compare ourselves to. And we like that and uh, because it makes us feel better. I mean, most of us don't like pain. This is where it comes from. We don't like pain. And so what we do is whenever we have pain is we look for a pain number. And there's, I mean, you know, that's why, you know, drugs are what they are. It's why, I mean, you know, and they're, they're, sometimes they're societal negatives, you know, that we like to beat up on, uh, alcohol, drugs, things of that nature. But we don't, we seldom beat up on workaholics, people who are in the gym 50 hours a week, you know, and they're pushing their body to the point that they're actually, you know, uh, in the hospital because they wore their body out by the time they're 45 or 50. You know, we say they're great and put them on magazine covers, you know, and, uh, and so, I mean, we, we're kind of twisted in that on, as a society, but all of that, not all, but a great deal of that can be used as a numbing agent. Uh, <coughs> For instance, have you ever bought something because you felt bad? Or do you, eat, do you eat something because you feel bad, right? You know, that's that, okay? That's, that's what it is. I mean, if you, you know, uh, if you want to know where that's coming from, all right, you know, stop for a minute. This is why the reflective self can't get away from this. Why you take a few moments and ask yourself why. Why am I actually wanting to do what I'm doing? Now, because what happens is, if you don't do that, and you do eat, or you do shop, or you do whatever, sometimes you act out in vengeance. You ever, you ever do that? Something happens, makes you feel pain, and instead of trying to analyze it or taking the time out, you send a jab right back. Do you ever do that? And we, we, guys do that real good. So, uh, but what normally happens after that experience? What do you feel? Yep. Wonderful. Yeah, what'd you say? Yeah. Hey, you said it. Say it loud, I didn't hear you. Guilt. Guilty or shameful. All right. That, you know, the idea is that we've uh, we have driven through a yellow light or a red light with God. Okay? And so, you know, in, in the natural feeling of that is, well, I didn't make that better. Well, I made that worse, you know. Uh, the, the other night, um, uh, Brooke and I, we were we were having a debate on something <laughs> about whether or not I should go to something and uh, that I'd already been to. And so uh, my my justification was, you know, uh, I don't let you do it. And um, and of course, uh, in our house, if it's one of those things that where it doesn't matter what the other other party feels, if we if, we, if, if they just need to do it, we call that an insist, all right? So if you're around, if you ever hear Brooke and I talking and, you know, the, every blue moon, you know, one of us might say, you know what, I'm just going to call it an insist here, which that's a code word for us to say, it doesn't matter what you think, you got to go and do it. Uh, you know, we don't abuse that, but, uh, you know, and so um, uh, normally the way this is, uh, this is Brooke's own self-disclosure, so I'm not telling you something that she hadn't already said in front of other folks. Normally, whenever uh, there would be a friendly debate that they have never had a sense of uh, resolution to, um, there would be uh, maybe some times of silence, 
for a day or so. Maybe some time to uh, try to guess at what's going on. And sometimes that will lead to another debate. Uh, and so before before uh, she left, she said, look, I understand where you're at. You know, I don't agree with you, but I just want to let you know that, you know, um, we're not going to kind of go through the circuit pattern. And uh, which what she was trying to say is, look, I've reflected, and, you know, it, it is what it is. I wish you would go. You're not going to go, or you don't feel like you need to go. I'm not going to say it's an insist, so we'll just kind of, you know, I'm not going to be mad. It's all going to be good. And so uh, the astute self that I, that I am, uh, instead of saying, thank you, honey, that's very, you know, fantastic, mature, I did one of these. I'll just go. I'll just go. <laughs> and, uh, and she was like, yeah, no, you missed it. I'm trying to say it's okay, and you're, you're messing it up, you know. And so, uh, um, so, anyways. Uh, the play looks good. Well, I already, saw, I already saw the play, you know. I saw the play three or four times, you know. I didn't see it again, you know. I was tired. I've been out all day working. You know, so. uh, and anyways, uh, but we, we missed that. We miss all kinds of things, we, you know, and when we don't, Pay attention to those those types of things, uh, these yellow lights or these red lights uh, that we find that show up from God inside of our life. Um, you know, I'm giving you the analogy: if you're riding down the road and you see a stop sign, that's a code. That's that's a that's a that's a warning. Stop. Slow down. If you go through it, it could be dangerous. And there are times when the Holy Spirit, conviction, past experiences that you learn from, things of that nature. And so the idea is, uh, you know, in, in, in Corinth, these people were missing all this stuff. And they had missed it for so long, they got comfortable with putting themselves at a higher place, you know, than what Paul is describing. And so he, he goes and, you know, very logically lays this out to these people that says, you know, you, you operate under his authority, under his ministry. He ultimately is the person that you're judged against, and he's the person that will judge you, not somebody else, not another concept, not somebody in history. You're judged against him, and, and, and he's also the giver of it all. So you can see how everything sits in Paul's mind with the idea of that we, it, all, it all goes back to God. And it all belongs to God. And, and we are just those who participate with what God is already doing. All right, does that, does that make sense? This is, this is kind of a core deal inside of, and I'm going to stop for a minute. Uh, this is a core concept inside of Paul, all of his letters. So it's not just something that shows up in Corinth. When you read uh, Romans, when you read, uh, particularly when he's talking to different people, uh, like uh, Timothy and things of that nature. Uh, I mean, you, Hebrews is a great book where it gives you these multiple analogies. You, you know, Christ as high priest, Christ as uh, lamb that was slain. You, you know, what he's doing is giving these analogies that paint that paint this picture. I mean, it, 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 it is either about Christ or it's not. And I know that sounds like duh, but the idea is now for us, either Christ is who the scriptures say, or he's not. For Paul, there's no in between. Right? I mean, he either it was, you know, uh, resurrected in glory, judge and giver, or pack it up and go do something else. But if you if you if you believe that he is, and if you fall into this this understanding, then he really is Lord. And Lord, you know what that means in the Greek? Lord. King. Ruler. I mean, you know, whatever word you I mean. So it's not this idea of, well, he's on Mondays and Wednesdays and Sundays for sure. You know, he's definitely Lord. But, you know, on, on Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays and, you know, and every other Thursday, he's not. But that's not it. Either he is, and we live under his lordship, or it's not. And, and what Paul has been stating is that he is, those who are in the church, you are under here, not up here. And for Paul, it never gets away. We can't get away from that. He's not the only one, but since we're reading Paul's letters, we'll 
will stay inside of what we call the calling corpus. So, all right, any comments or questions? This is also a good time to take a break. All right, and we'll work on trying to clean the board up. All right, uh, take a 15 minute break. Best to carpool. Yeah, if you can, just come here and carpool together. We have limited parking. Right. But if a few of you could come park here and all come together. Sure. Okay. It's normal time, right? Is that right? 945. 9.45. and then we have a shorter lesson and a longer lunch. Okay. And if you will bring serving spoons from your dish, that would okay. be helpful. Do we do we need do we need to like coordinate with you what we're bringing or okay all right, all right. okay that's fine uh, uh, some have asked how Richard Betts is doing um, I talked to Fran uh, today's Tuesday um, Sunday night there if everything goes well he'll come home uh, on Thursday afternoon and be here for a number of weeks. Uh, but as of today, or at least the last time they uh, uh, have ran tests, the uh, treatments have not been working. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, he'll come home, he's, he'll be in those in-between periods where he'll come home and, and rest for a bit. I'm sure that they'll take some, some more scans and run some more tests. And uh, if still, you know, still hoping to go back to MD Anderson later on I think maybe near the end of May uh, so um, but uh, not body not responding well to uh, to the treatments um, Andrew Wade is is still doing very well um, uh, I hope to see Andrew today so I'll have a next time we meet I'll have a, a good update um, last time I talked a trip I think maybe been about uh, just before they left to go up to Scottish Rite um, you know doing well uh, relatively speaking, I think now the uh, treatments have, uh, they have um, amped up a little bit in the strands of medicine that they're giving in the treatments, which has had, uh, uh, when I say detrimental, not detrimental to the healing process, detrimental, it's, it's made him very sick. And uh, so up until then, uh, he, had, he had been able to handle the treatments fairly well. Uh, without any type of uh, the, the, the great levels of nausea and sickness that can come with treatments. But I know the last, the last strand that they gave him, uh, it, you know, maybe a month ago, and I think he's going to get that for a little bit. Uh, I mean, he, he was ha having a, a negative reaction there. But he is progressing well with the mobility side, and every time they have done a scan or a test, it's been exactly what the doctors have wanted. So, uh, body's responding well to not just the physical therapy, but also the, uh, the treatments. Um, Richard, uh, not so much. So I know that Richard, if you know Richard, I know that he would welcome any conversations or at least uh, texts or emails or cards. Um, he has commented to me how, how helpful that has been, particularly in, in the time that he's been out in Houston. So uh, but May 13th will be our last meeting. Uh, Sunday for St. Paul is a pretty big day. That's Confirmation Sunday for us, this, and it'll be a little bit of a different service. Uh, Ma'am? Uh, this, this coming Sunday, I'm sorry, I thought you were asking. Uh, uh, Kay Young. Kay Young, okay, it's, uh, I haven't looked um, at all the list yet. Kay, Kay Young is having surgery. major, major back surgery Thursday morning, I think. I did not talk to her yesterday. She is basically been bed ridden oh. practically and has a walker type thing. I tried to get she's it just yesterday. Not getting up, not home. Or right. she no, I couldn't get her either. She, she may have been in pre op yesterday. Okay. I get her. But she's um Dr. Goldman's operating on a Monday. I mean excuse me, Thursday morning, I believe. Okay. All right. I, I will be talking to her today, and that, I find that any difference. Yeah, if uh, if any of these that uh, you, especially those that have a, uh, where the concern is in between our visits, uh, I mean, if you want to give updates, if you'll just email them to Kathy. I am. I'm Kathy okay. can email them out to, to the larger group uh, so that we don't necessarily have to wait until, um, until the following um, Tuesday. 
Uh, and I know some have it looks like some cataract surgeries uh, as well. Hope for good things there. Uh, any other any other questions about the prayer sheet? Uh, but Sunday is confirmation for us, and I think we have a 20, 20 21, somewhere there. Really. And uh, so we have, uh, it's a different service, and it's a wonderful service, and uh, and that will push communion to the following Sunday. Just to, and that's nothing more than just a time element of trying to get all the, not trying to rush through confirmation. We really don't want to. We want, and this is a number of things for the person, the confirmand. Uh, and for the family, and for the mentors, and for the church, the, uh, the welcoming process. Uh, but at the same time, one of the things that, uh, and I'm going to give you my perspective on this one, one of the things I think that we've lost currently that we're hoping to regain, and you've got to look at the church in large segments of time, is the rites of passage that we used to have that were wonderful uh, years and years ago. And um, uh, confirmation, I mean, if you go back and study the early church, uh, I mean, com confirmation was, I mean, it's where we get the whole catechism concept from. I mean, uh, the idea of someone just, you know, without any concern or thought or preparation, just, you know, uh, leap into something without even fully grasping the whole scope of it. Now, we're okay with that, but not at the expense of the process that it takes for someone to grow. Uh, one of the things that, um, in, and you can, you can follow this from the Protestant Reformation, there's been about four or five major times that the church has went back and regained the whole concept of process and how we can help people along the way. But, uh, one of the one of the negatives of the Protestant Reformation is that if everything is justification by faith, well, the moment someone is to use the word converted, that's it. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, it's like uh, I made it. You know, uh, I've, I've, I've you know I've been baptized. I joined the church. Uh, I took my my public confessions of my vow. Uh, it's it. I don't have to worry about anything. All right, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm making somewhat light of it, but there have been periods in the church where that has been, particularly whenever there is a huge outpouring of evangelical activity. Now, don't, don't read conservatism in that, but, but the idea e evangelical in the sense of where what's highlighted is the... the revival type understanding of salvation. Uh, whenever there had been a period of that, First Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, things of that nature, what normally happens after that is this misstep. And so, you know, if you go back, you know, Jonathan Edwards, First Great Awakening, you know, remember your old history lessons, Sinners in the Hands of Angry God, you know, that sermon sparks a great big outpouring of, of salvation via justification by faith. Well, what happens after that for about a hundred years is a, a, a overzealous legalism and an idea that once I am justified, that's all that is needed. And those are kind of, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. One, the pendulum swings over here, and the other, the pendulum swings back over there. And, and so the church has been guilty of, of just uh, doing that, uh, and it repeats itself. I mean, it's amazing how fast, how often we do that. And uh, um, the Inquisition, you go back to that time period, back in uh, in European history, that that is one of those time periods. And uh, and what we forget is this uh, salvation. Salvation described in the New Testament is something that takes place instantaneous, like justification uh, of faith, uh, and at the same time, if, if you want to draw it in a math box, and at the same time, there is the sanctification process, uh, you know, which is the holiness of heart and life. And, uh, and this, this is salvation right here. All of this is salvation. And so you can't, you can't, dissect one and say 
Well, if you overemphasize justification by faith, the, you know, the idea is, the way that gets played across in theology is, you're a sinner, confess faith in Christ, and be saved. Okay? You've heard that before, right? If you've grown up in the South, I know that you've heard it. Okay? <laughs> Although that you've grown up in the South. You know, that, 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 that happens. Uh, and, you know, so if we overemphasize that, then well, what happens after somebody confesses faith and believes? Well, we don't know. That's what normal happen. We're not worried about that. You know, they'll be a part of the church and it'll just happen naturally. It doesn't. And so, uh, and so people, you know, there might be a great inpouring inside the church. And, you know, people, it's, it's almost like uh, um, uh, if you ever go to watch a football game, I don't know why I'm stuck on football. Um, but if you ever go to watch a football game and you're going to an opponent's stadium, where you don't really know what, what it's like in the stadium and whatnot, but you got your ticket, and you go in and, and you hand your ticket to the person and they, they stamp it or scan it, and then you walk in and it's like, all right, now what do I do? You know, where am I, where am I sitting? I don't know. You know I mean, you help me out. Where's the usher? You know, and so what we, you know, in the church, we say, okay, come on in, believe in Jesus, confess faith, you know, you're, you're a sinner. By grace, you're saved by faith. Boom, justification. We like it, it's good. Come on in the church. But then what? And then, or what we do at other periods of times is that we, we focus in on this and we say, well, don't worry about how you get into the church or how you come into the kingdom. Who cares if it has anything to do with Jesus? Just focus on doing good things. Right? And so one of the ways that it's played out is uh, uh, inside one of, the, one of the words today over the last probably 40 years that has become a hotbed for this is Social justice. You heard that phrase? That word? Now, what, what actually is? So what comes to your mind when you hear social justice? Anybody? Taking care of people. Right. Taking care of people. Uh, getting involved with things like what? Open door? What else? Homeless. Yeah, take care of homeless. Uh, habitat. What did you say? You said habitat. What else? Soup kitchens. You know, uh, clothing cart. VIP, you know, all that. All, all those are, you know, uh, um, and so we, if you over, if you just kind of sit here and say, well, it's about just doing holy things or good things that mirror what God's kingdom would look like, well, then you, you know, you don't know if someone's in the kingdom or not in the kingdom. And it's a good thing Jesus says in one of his parables, you know, uh, somebody comes in the middle of the night and in your flower gardens, they sow a bunch of weeds. And, you know, if you pull the weeds out, then you're going to kill the flower that you just planted. And so the, the laborers go to the owner and say, what do you want us to do? And he says, you know how it ends? He says, well, yeah, just so they broke together. At the end, we'll let God sort it out. You know, so we, you know, it's all God's going to take care of it anyway, so we'll just let God do it. You know, so. uh, but, you know, the neither one of these by themselves is, is, the full biblical picture. But now the church is good at separating the two. And so, you know, we, we do this from time to time. I think the idea of one of the ways that practically we can help bring these two back together is through some of the ancient rites of passages that show up in the church primarily in worship. Now, don't read just because we do them. That means that it's all good. There, there is the idea of intent behind the action and the action itself. Does that make sense? And so what we, uh, what we do, and is, and this is, there are other denominations that do this, so it's not just us. And there's some denominations that don't do this, so it's just if they don't do it, they have their own way that they do it too. Uh, for us, uh, if you were here on church on Sunday. You know, one of the things that we did is we baptized uh, Buddy's uh, granddaughter, all right? There are five things that show up, tenets of baptism. One of them is welcoming, welcoming them in to the congregation, to the family. Now, what that doesn't mean is they're perfect, nor does it ever mean that they will be perfect, but it is an actual, there, there is a time, it's important for us to know that God welcomes all people in, into His church. Uh, he wants to welcome all people into the kingdom. And so we want to start that as early as possible. Now long before Ellie has any understanding, she's not going to remember that. Okay, She's not. 
Now if they took pictures, maybe a video, and you know, they'd show it to her, you know, but now notice who was taking the, the vows Sunday. Who was it? Was it Ellie? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Aaron. Who else? Yeah. Congregation. Yeah. What do we both pledge? Yeah. Nurture. Yeah. To love. To, to, I mean, so there's that God, model, all, you know, all those words are appropriate. So there, there is a point where what we have done is say, we know that God loves every person so much, we're going to officially sign the contractual document that says we're going to model and continually model what it means to live inside of God's kingdom for her. Right? Now we don't say that it's uh, we're responsible for what faith she does take or doesn't take. We didn't pledge that. What we pledged was the things that we can control and what we can do, God, we're going to do that and we ask for your help. Now what we hope is that there will be a day that as Ellie grows or whoever it may grow, they start to see what it means to live uh, under Christ, to live in God's kingdom, that eventually that there will be uh, a time where they can say yes to that on their own. Confirmation is that experience. And so... Uh, what, what we do is, uh, through the confirmation process, is it's all laid out. And, uh, and the idea is, uh, you know, they, they talk about all the things that they can remember experience. We, get you know, we have conversations with the parents, mentors, all that stuff. But anyway, at the, you know, at the end of the process, you know, it's a year-long process for here at St. Paul, it is to say, you know, you don't have to say yes to this. And there are people who don't. Okay? I mean, it's, you know, it's not... It's not like they, they're kicked out or anything like that. I mean, it's just okay. It's not, they're not ready yet. Okay, we're fine with that. It doesn't stop what we're going to do. Remember, we, we vow to do what? <coughs> right? And, and it's not contingent upon anything. We're just that's who, we're going to be that type of person. But for those who go through the confirmation process for us, we offer them and the church a, a, a heightened time. Okay? Uh, there are times where you know, it's not just regular. This is a heightened time where we honor and celebrate and acknowledge their decisions. Okay? And so it's very formal. All right? And there's a laying on of hands. There's vows that they take. You know? But if we stopped here, what happens? We don't know. It's a, it's a crapshoot. Okay? For some, they do well. For others, they do not. Okay? Shane, when you're working with the confirmands, do you teach the words uh, justification, sanctification, glorification, or do you teach the concepts? Uh, we teach both. Okay. You do use those words. We do. Uh, but now we don't, I mean, uh, there's no grand illusions that a sixth grader is going to understand it the way of uh, you know, 40 year old or 50 year old or 60 year old or whatnot will. But it's a deep taste. Sure, we do. We do. We, I mean, you'd be surprised what St. Paul teaches. Uh, I mean, I'm not in that. I mean, you would be surprised. But it, it is a very, very uh, strong confirmation experience. Okay? Now, and I'm not, I'm not only talking about St. Paul because that's the one I'm in right now. There are other churches that do as well. It's not just that St. Paul has the patent on it, okay? I mean, they're, they're very strong churches. And some of them don't do it as formal through a confirmation, but they're, you know, they're, they have these types of experiences. And, and for some, it might not be here. It might be the experiences here, you know, if we're talking about age of a child as they grow. But the concept is that, at least, and I'll speak from St. Paul's experience, we do celebrate this concept in grand fashion, with as much honor as we can inside the worship service. And there's a full acknowledgement of God's activity in their life and, and that uh, we, we, we all have received grace and we respond to God's grace uh, uh, as a gift that He gives to us. And there is the expectation of this. And that is taught. Right? And so what we do is then we... We then have follow-ups, you know, whether it be through youth ministry or things of that nature, acknowledging this, but with the expectation of that, right? And so, uh, but this is 
regardless, you can take out St. Paul now, regardless of what individual local church or what denomination, both of these are expected and not one is more important than the other. Does that make sense? And what happens in the church's history is if this is a pendulum, we swing back and forth of which one is of more importance. But you have to have the justification. Oh, oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, it, there's there's entrance in, okay? I mean, it, it, it's not that... Uh, but you don't want it to say, this is just one, this is just one, and then you read the next to the beginning, but it's not the end. Right, right, right. Yeah, uh, bingo, yeah. There, there is a level of where, uh, you know, God, okay? And so that there's, you know, so make sure you understand what players are involved. And uh, so um, there's no, it's not to say that just because this happens, you don't have to worry about this. But what salvation is, which is why, uh, who was I talking to? Uh, the tenses, all three tenses, during the break I was talking to someone about this, all three tenses are used interchangeably in the New Testament when it comes to salvation. You were being saved. You are being saved at this very moment. And there will be a day, future tense, where you will be saved too. Well, which one's more important? Which tense is more right than the other? It's like a stair step. Ma'am? It's like a stair step. Sure. So that you, you're at one level and then you hopefully develop and become more mature and get to the next level of salvation. Right, I mean, which then has as an undercurrent this idea of growth process. But, but whether or not you're on stair one, to, to use your analogy, or stair 50, you're still saved, to use, I mean, to use the, the, the tense. But my point is that um, for God, God doesn't see, I mean, we have described, we have used the term justification by faith, sanctification by faith, okay? Those are terms we use to try to describe the salvation process and experience. What God says is, I save. Does that make sense? I, I save. And it's always present tense for Him. All right? Now, you've got to put your thing caps on because now we're leaving out of what time and space. They're human concepts. But the idea is that, you know, God, because of Jesus, offers grace and mercy. And that's something God never stops offering. When you read the very ends of the book of Revelation, you find just as loving and a gracious God as you find in the very beginning of the Gospels. It does not go away. And so the idea for God is, um, remember, go back to when we looked at uh, Mark, Mark's language. You've got the idea of kingdom, okay? All right? You live in God's kingdom. All right? And so, you know, as, as a citizen in God's kingdom, well, I mean, that's it. I mean, it's not like an idea of, you know, I was a citizen day one, or I was a citizen day 500 gazillion, whatever number it is. Uh, I mean, which one has greater citizenship inside of our country? Someone who took the vow yesterday or somebody who was born? They got the idea of running for president, I guess, you know. That's the right thing, that's right, or Congress, whatever it is. You know, but, but can, you know, can you vote? I think both of them can. I guess you can you know, apply for all the stuff that comes your way, correct? Does that make sense? You know, now, we, we are the ones who like to say this one is more important than that one. You know, they're, they're Johnny come lately's or uh, Jane come lately. You know, not them. It is what it is. It's not a uh, how many years served process. And so, I mean, even inside the church, it's not one of these deals where, you know, you, you've been, you know, guess what? You've been a believer or a follower of Christ for five, you know, however many days of your life compared to somebody that was one day into it. Go back and read Luke chapter 15. There is one recurring phrase that shows up in three parables. You got the parable of the lost coin. Remember the lady? That's ten coins. She was one. You got the parable. What's the next one? Sheep. There you go. All right, we're doing good. Go. You read your Bibles. Excellent. Good for y'all. What's the third one? Prodigal son. No, the prodigal son, right? 
the phrase that shows up is that there is celebration, I'm going to paraphrase it, great joy in heaven when what? Bingo. Not when, not, I mean, not the idea of, you know, they do it on day one or they do it on a gazillion days because what doesn't show up in the parables is time elements. How long did it take the lady to find the lost coin? Don't know. How long did it take the, the person to go find the sheep? Don't know. How back to the father? Don't know. It, well, exactly. I mean, that's, but it, that's all it says after you know after a while. But 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 but, but it did okay. But the idea is, uh, when did the father say yes to the son? After he called a council meeting. Bingo. Yeah, long before what the son even had a moment to go through his little spiel. You know. Uh, I mean, so it's, the idea is God sees this. And so this is what God expects. The, the idea of, yeah, new birth, there's, that's a great image. You know, I'm, I'm not, and then I am. Okay, I understand that. You know, but just because I am, you know, none of us give birth to a child, and then you want the child to be a baby forever, right? Maybe so for a while. <laughs> um, you know, way, way in the beginning, you're glad the baby's a baby, but then after a while, you want the baby to get out of a few things. You know? then, then, you want the baby, then you want to go back, you know, so, uh, or her to go back. You know? uh, but, I mean, you know, there's to have less love is to, because you love and you care, and there's emotional ties that are tied. And, but, you know, I, I get to be around a lot of people who, who have children all the time. I've never met someone that says, I, I want to less love my child enough so that my child will constantly be an infant. What's written into the love is, I hope one day they grow and become mature, well-adjusted. Does that make sense? I want them to have a family. You know what I'm saying? You've got all these the hopes and dreams for it. What's not written is, I just want to kind of freeze my child into three months forever. Now you can. That's, you know, it'll take about 50 years of counseling to get out of that. <laughs> so save yourself some money and don't do it. You know? or then some. Um, but, you know, there, this is salvation for God. Not this. Not that. See, even when we talk about the concept of grace, okay? We talk about it. Th these are terms that we use to help explain it. The moment someone believes justifying grace, right? Or actually before, convicting grace. I know I need something, right? Then justifying grace. Then this whole sanctifying grace, all right? It's still just grace to God. Convenient. Well, convenient, yeah, what goes before. Convicting, convenient, interchangeable words. Um, then the moment believing, seeing what God has done, this whole time period, saying yes to that, justifying. Well, I mean, when did it stop being convenient and start being justifying to God? God would say it's just all grace. Right? When does it stop being you know, justifying grace and start being sanctifying grace or glorifying grace? Well, it's just all grace to God. Same concept. We, we use it to help explain this whole process. But for God, this is what salvation looks like. We're just the ones that mess it up from time to time. And, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we're bad people. We just... We're trying to emphasize something, and you know, we, in doing so, we don't tell the whole story, or we don't tell the beginning part of the story. Now, now I'm speaking in terms of, you know, longer periods of time. I don't mean, you know, just like in five-minute conversation. I'm talking about periods of church history. This is where we we get in trouble from time to time, and and, and you know, it happens, and. Uh, you know, to, uh, it not, not so much in this book, but if you read the book of Galatians, the church is struggling with this. And you know, you, you've got to go and prove your worth to God by doing works. Right? Go read the book of Galatians. Watch how Paul responds to that. We're overemphasizing this, and you're totally missing this. Now you read the book of James, he wants to overemphasize this, and you know, maybe not, you know, 
He's not trying to tackle this. He's highlighting on this. All right? Galatians, you know, the, 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 you know, Paul is trying to say, just like, you know, go back to a full picture. James, go back to a full picture. Which one do you need both of them? Which means Martin Luther's wrong. Which breaks my heart. But he got it wrong. He wanted people to throw out the book of James. He actually had his students rip out the, the book from the Bible. Because he's highlighting this. I'm sorry? If you, if you truly believe in something, you want to give your all, your works, your talents, to make it better. Yes, and keep going. <laughs> Sometimes. Because what that's, is this? In the Bible it says lukewarm, being lukewarm is nothing. It, it is. Uh, that comes in Revelation chapter 13, I mean chapter 3. Uh, um, uh, there is an idea that if you do love something, you will give yourself to it. Um, the, the only reason why I said and is because sometimes in, in, in church history and understanding, we like to use that for code words to say uh, um, just stop doing something. You know, if you really love God, then you'll, you'll quit sinning. All right? How's that been working for you? <laughs> anybody, anybody sinned? Uh, all right. Uh, let's, let's actually do a show of hands on this one. How many of you have sinned since believing in God? <laughs> Don't make any easy problems, right? All right? Well, you know, if you really love God, then why would you do that? Does that make sense? And so we... we you're right. You're 100% right. What we've done as, as a people is we can use even right or truth as a belt. Uh, you, you know what I mean by that? Um, uh, it, well, just that way. You know, if, uh, if, you were, if you really love God, you'd stop behaving that way. Well, sometimes it's just not that easy. Some people have a host of experiences that they're trying to work through. And if they're trying to work through, you know, for somebody who hasn't had a lot of bad things to happen in their life, maybe their experiences are easy. But what about someone who, uh, for instance, it's been proven, people who have been sexually abused, they normally act out sexually. Okay? So then we start talking about the concept inside the Bible that talks about purity sexually, is that going to be easy or hard for them? Bingo. So should we just say, if you really love God, then stop doing it? Well, that might be right, but that's easier said than done. Does that make sense? Somebody can visit, ma'am? Keep on trying. That's, sure, sure. That's the real, real story, because it takes up things longer to grow and mature than it does other. Say that last part again. The last, remember what you just said? Because it takes some things longer. Process. Right? It doesn't negate what they believe. It doesn't negate the love that they have. The good news is that because God loves them, and they respond to that, and so there's a you know the idea of new creation. God's DNA and the person's DNA, that's my terms, coming together and forming a new, a new creation. Because they see that, we're going to use the idea of, say, the views, that people begin to see a different reality. That's one of the things that we believe that God does, I mean, that grace does. It, it, it parts the, the clouds for a moment and lets you see things differently. See yourself differently, see concepts like love differently, see concepts like trust differently. Uh, and so when, when those, uh, through a work of God, people respond to that, they believe, all right, justified. But that is a, a continuing factor that leads, pushes, guides, uh, you know, uh, them to this process of wholeness. If that makes sense. Um, uh, because I know God loves me, I want to respond this way. I want to seek after it more. I don't know. I, I have no clue. 
how that's going to play out. But I do know that my life without God might look like this, and I don't. I know what that feels like, and what that looks like. I don't want that. And so, if there is salvation in God, grace breaks into the person's life, and they, they start to get glimpses of that along the way. One of the things that keeps them on the path, pursuing it, is God's grace. If that makes sense. Because again, it's all grace to God. It's not just something that is, uh, you know, before salvation, the moment somebody is saved, or you know, you know, when they die, or you know, however you want to define glorification. God is just offering grace, and God's purpose in life is to bring about the image of His Son inside of the life of the person, and grace doesn't stop until that until that has its finality. Which is why even after death, God is going to work works of transformation. Does that make sense? Again, all of this is salvation. Work, works of transformation with the person that died? Sure. What we call glorification. New body, you know, all that stuff. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the idea... Is, well, the idea is image... Well, that's an interesting debate, and if you don't want to go down that, we can. Uh, you know, if the idea is to form Christ inside the person, however that looks, and whatever that takes place, uh, you know, God's grace will work to bring about this until it happens. Now, He's not the only agent, okay? There's a personal agent that's responding, and God, you know, has an agent that is responding, but we're only talking about what God is seeking to do inside the person. Again, go back to C.S. Lewis. I know it's not something that we love, but the idea of you got free will, and you got, which means you got freedom and you got power, all right? And that what we learned about God's uh, love, His divine love, is that His divine love will not violate things that He's already given to the person, freedom and power. And so people have a people have a uh, have a choice. And they, have, they have a part to play in this. Uh, and we just walk down another rabbit hole, so just, let's just stop there. Um, actually, I wanted us to talk about this. This is not just something that just kind of came up, because the last part of the chapter is, uh, is fairly, um, I'm not going to say simple, but it's, it's just two concepts. Um, how many of y'all ever are sarcastic in your conversation, maybe when you're having a debate or something along those lines. Or, or, uh, or like say if something comes up and you're having one of those debates and, and you say, oh, well, I'm this then, okay? I must be the one. Obviously, if you've done this, then I'm the one who's the problem because, you know, I'm the one that says this. I'm the one that always does that. I'm the one that... You know, that ever you know what I mean by that? Uh, Paul's doing that with the people of Corinth. You know, the idea of this, he's making a comparison between himself and the church. Oh, you're the high and mighty ones. Oh, I, you know, I'm just a lowly person. You know, I'm not even really a full apostle or disciple. I saw Jesus late. Everybody else saw him early. I mean, he's, that's what he's doing. You know, and, and, and why do you do that with people? Make a point. What point? Right, and in hopes that their behavior would what change. Uh, that's uh, debating via shame. I mean, that's, that's what he's doing. And uh, and I mean, you know, he actually admits that in verse fourteen. All right, verse fourteen comes after this that next segment, verse eight through uh, thirteen, where he's, he's kind of you know doing this you know oh you're so great I'm not you know I'm, I'm, and then verse, you know, I'm writing all this not, you know, this is being sarcastic too, not, not to be ashamed, you know, but, uh, you know, my, my goal is that I want your behavior to change, but I don't want you to, you know, I don't want to put you down and then keep you down forever because my goal of doing this is that you would actually behave and start acting the way you should. Does that make sense? So, uh, so what you have is, uh, you know, Paul is in, you know, probably loved a little bit of sarcasm. And you find 8 through 13, this compare contrast between himself and the leaders. 
And, you know, if you know Paul's life, which they would have, you can see through that there's a little tongue-in-cheek in this, right? And then, and the goal, though, is not to beat him up and keep him there, but the hope is that, you know, listen, can't you see what you're doing? I mean, there's, there's, there's multiple ways you can try to correct behavior. You can go to someone and be very direct and say, you're doing it wrong, stop it. All right? That might work. But what happens if it doesn't? You've got to come up with another way to talk to them about it. And this is Paul coming up with another way to talk to them about it. <coughs> uh, it's it's uh, a little, little tongue in, little, little tongue in cheek. Um, but the goal, uh, now when you get to 14 through the end of the chapter, chapter, you know, you've got him not being uh, as sarcastic as he was before, because what you know now, now he's actually stating what he really wants to happen. You know, I don't want you to be ashamed. I, you know, I just want you to lead. You've been given leadership for a purpose. The purpose is to bring about God's kingdom, to bring about the image of Christ in people. You know, do that. Now, I'm giving you a paraphrase. We're not going through it verse by verse. Peter said, Peter's going to say to like a father who's trying to help his son. Right. Well, I mean, you know, and you do that for a while. It might work, but then... If they get a little bit older, can't do it that way, right? You gotta have, you gotta come up with a, you know, you gotta come up with a little, you know, let me just kind of show you this, but I'm gonna, you know, let me go in the back door type and, and get you to see something. Does that make sense? Uh, the way I, when I was reading this uh, and, and preparing, I, I thought about I, I'll do this with my son all the time, and, and then with Caroline as well. <coughs> say if something's happened and just going and being very direct doesn't work, I'll just say, well, let's just kind of do what is humor me. You know, you just kind of, what you're doing is you're baiting it. You know, well, let's just think about what happens if you don't want to do your homework, all right? You know, I know you want to go to Georgia Tech. You want to be an engineer, okay? Which means that you probably got to get into a high school, right? You know, so, you know, if you, if you don't pass, I guess you could go to school with your sister. You know, and, and, and then, you know, if you don't pass again, you know, I guess she could, she'll be the one driving you to school. You know, I guess that's okay. You know, I know your friends aren't going to worry about that. You know, oh, I'll tell you what, just... Don't, don't study any ever. And you can just kind of stay in your room and, you know, mom and dad will, will give you three square meals, but, you know, uh, you're not going to, you know, you might have a hard time getting a job, so, you know, I guess you won't, you know, but, 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 you know don't worry about it. I, see, I mean, that's kind of what's going on, all right? That's what Paul's doing. And, uh, and you know, which is, which is sort of clever, if you think about it. Um, but I do want to stop at 14. I mean, uh, four, because I don't want us to go into chapter five until next week. And I've got chapter five uh, slides available if you want to go ahead and get them. Because at chapter five, there's a total change of topic. We're going to leave the general conversation about leadership and theology and things of that nature. And we're going to deal with a very specific problem inside the church. And it's not a nice one. And so, but if you want to get... Uh, some of the slides ahead of time can I will have them for next weekend. Uh, so, anyway, any comments or questions about anything we've looked at in the text or about uh, this up here? Um, any, any comments or, or whatnot? And this um, last sentence, and I don't know what version of Oh, you know, uh, the very last <coughs> verse says, um, What would you prefer? Right. Sure, sure. And, and, you know, and there'll be times inside of First Corinthians where Paul uses both. I mean, there are times like chapter five, it's a stick. All right. Yeah, we have, okay, whip, knife, gun, stick, you can put whatever in there. I mean, uh, uh, to use probably good, better terms, uh, should I use positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement? Right. Chapter five, you can't get around. It's negative reinforcement. <coughs> right. So, uh, anyways, read chapter five, and we'll look at that. Maybe even get into chapter six. These, some of these chapters can go kind of quick. I know that's what thinking, but you know, gotta have a goal. All right, may the Lord bless you. Go in peace. Uh,